Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, friends, wherever in the globe you happen to find yourself. My name is Carmen Mazera, and I serve as Executive Director of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, or APSIA, to which all of your institutions belong. I'm very pleased to welcome you to another one of our APSIA career webinars for the graduate students and recent alum of our member programs. We love to share more information with you about all of the different career possibilities within our space. And in this case, we know the wonderful work that happens through the CRS International Development Fellows Program. And I look forward to hearing your questions and to helping you all think about this as an option when you finish your degree programs. A recording of this session will be available on the APSIA YouTube page afterwards. And I will put that link in the chat, but it is simply youtube.com slash apsiatube. So be sure to check out this recording and lots of other great sessions that we have there. I also want to invite any of you who are Canadian citizens to join us next week. The Canadian government will be sharing their analyst program. That's a two year opportunity for Canadian uh, nationals who have finished their master's programs to go in and rotate through different parts of the government there, doing great work on their behalf. And so with that, I'm about to turn the floor over to our colleague from CRS to share more information. But I also, but I invite you now, if you have questions that you absolutely don't want to leave without us touching on, put those in the chat and we will be sure to get you the information you need. And if you have any technical issues during the course of the webinar, please feel free to send me a direct message and we'll do our best to sort you out. And so with that, I am all done talking. Netta, please, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Carmen. It is my pleasure to be here today with all of you. I'm so excited that you're interested in learning more about Catholic Relief Services and specifically the International Development Fellows Program. And my goal for today is to kind of walk you through the program, kind of key components of the program, a little bit about CRS in general, and we'll touch on the application process, the selection process. So we'll really try to kind of give you all the key information that you might need to decide if this program is something you'd like to pursue. And um, I hope it'll be as conversational as possible, though I find that I have a lot of information to share. We tend to get lots of questions and I find myself speaking most of the time, but um, we will have a few few breaks during um, where I'll ask you guys to feel free to share verbally or share in the chat any questions or reflections that you have. So just to um, say a couple of things about myself, um, as you can see my name here, Netta Sopani, I manage our talent pipeline programs at CRS and some of our leadership programs. The International Development Fellows Program is probably our most well-known program that focuses on recruiting top talent, building them up in specific skill areas and helping them to transition and grow with CRS. And many fellows go on to have long careers with CRS. I started with CRS as a fellow in Senegal about 12 years ago. And from there, I went to West Darfur to manage our water sanitation and shelter programming. After that, I went to Liberia and supported livelihoods programming, also related to emergency response. And from there, I went to Burkina Faso and spent about five years working in education um, programming there. So. Um, my kind of time overseas with CRS is not uncommon for what a lot of fellows do. We tend to move between regions, to move between technical sectors, and most fellows tend to move along a, along a general management track um, with increasing levels of responsibilities, larger program portfolios that we manage, and things like that. So you'll see a little bit about kind of some of the roles that fellows tend to move into right after the fellowship. And if you have more questions about sort of where they go in the longer term, I am happy to talk about that as well. 
So um, before I jump into CRS kind of 101, who we are, what we do, and the fellowship, I'm curious to just get a sense of how much you may know about CRS already. So if, if, um, if anybody has kind of worked or volunteered for CRS, please share in the chat. I would love to hear what you have done if you've interacted with CRS already. Um, but I'd like to ask everybody to just give me a guess. Um, how many countries do you think or do you know that CRS is working in today? So please just give me your, your best guess. Oh, awesome. I see 126, 101. Awesome. Okay, great. Good. So just curious, testing to see if anyone's done any research before coming today. All right, so, um, so CRS today is in around 116 countries. It really does vary because of the world and you know changing dynamics. Um, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, we had a fellow who moved to um, a program manager position in Italy right after her fellowship. And that was just like mind blowing to me because I was like, what? How are we placing people in Italy? But that was at the very early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so all of a sudden CRS was working in Italy, which you know I'm sure we hadn't been there since the end of World War II. Um, speaking of which, CRS is just celebrating our 80th anniversary. So we've been around for a very long time um, that you can see kind of on this map, the countries where CRS is active today. Um, but again, as I said, this does kind of shift and change. Most fellows will go on to roles in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Middle East, North Africa region. I'd say those are kind of where most fellows end up going afterwards. Um, some may take positions in Asia, some in South and Central America, but Sub-Saharan Africa is really kind of where a lot of fellows tend to land. Um, CRS, as you know, um, is a Catholic organization, obviously, name is in our title. Um, and as part of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, our mission is to serve individuals overseas. So we have other sister organizations that serve in the United States, but all of CRS's programming is outside of the US. And you can see our mission here. A lot of times people ask, do I have to be Catholic to work at CRS or to advance at CRS? You absolutely do not. We are a very large organization, about 8,000 people worldwide. A lot of them come from faith-based backgrounds. A lot of them do not, um, but that isn't any sort of criteria in terms of working for a CRS. And it doesn't, um, our, um, it doesn't show up in the work that we do. Um, in terms of like the kind of work that we do, which I will ask you a little bit of a question about that in a second before I jump into it. Um, but what you will see about CRS um, are um, that you, this are our guiding principles, and this is important, and this is related to who we are as a Catholic organization. And so these guiding principles um, influence how we work and how we approach our interactions with the communities that we serve. So these principles will be integrated when we are designing projects um, and determining how to approach different situations, for example. Let me give you one example to kind of highlight how you may see this in action. I love to use the example of subsidiarity because I think it's kind of the easiest to highlight. And some of you may be familiar with this term, um, but essentially what it means is that the people or persons who are closest to an issue should be really at the forefront of leading that response. And so as you saw on the previous slide, CRS works with a large number of partner organizations. And this is really stemming from our principle of subsidiarity. So in all locations, CRS works with a variety of different partners. These can be local NGOs that might be faith-based or non-faith-based. Um, government is a huge partner, local universities, research institutions. 
Um, and what we, as a, we're really a capacity building organization. So what we do is we identify local partners who are well suited to lead um, responses. And on lots of projects, we'll have a group of partners that are, you know, one might be managing the education component, one may do a health component, for example. Um, so we really identify and work with local partners in all of our locations. Sometimes you might see CRS leading on a response, but that's usually just in an early onset after an emergency, and that response would transition to a partner as soon as we're able to identify a partner and start working with them. So that's just a little bit on kind of part of our approach and how you'll see um, the Catholic values um, coming out in the way that we work overseas. Okay. I kind of alluded to what kind of work we do. And um, when I was saying, you know, it, we are not, um, you know, kind of there to like bring people to Catholicism and things like that. Of course, that's not the nature of our work. Um, I would love to hear your guesses on what do you think are the primary areas in which CRS works? So what would you think are our core sectors, core areas of, of, of work or response? Please put them in the chat. What do you think? Awesome. Food security, wash, education. Okay. Are you guys just pulling on my quick bio? <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, no, but you're absolutely right. These are these are core areas for us. Um, so here they are on the slide. And essentially, what you'll see is that in most countries, you'll see an integrated portfolio of programming. So, you know, we will have, for example, I'll take the education program that I worked on in Burkina. I label it as an education program because we were intervening in about 800 schools. So our main kind of... Um, you know, area of implementation was in the schools, but we actually had a very large um, literacy component that was around teacher training. We had a food distribution component that relates to food security and nutrition. We had a health component of distributing vitamins and things like that. There was a microfinance component that was there to assist, assist parents with raising money for school supplies and things like that. So it's one program we label as education, but really has an integrated packet of um, activities that we're doing. Here's a really cute slide with donkeys. I think donkeys are adorable. I don't like when they stubbornly stay in the road. Um, I'm sure you, many of you have experienced that. I'm gonna cover them up for a second just so you can see some data points. This is just to give you a little feel of kind of the scale to which CRS is working in, different, in these different areas. So emergency response is a huge um, sector for CRS. It's one that we've been doing since our initial days um, of responding after World War II. So even today, we're about half of the countries we're working in, there is emergency response programming happening. Um, a lot of programs, though, have emergency response and development-related responses, so um, nutrition, agriculture, education, all of these things um, are included. These are sort of the big buckets. So, you know, there are things that we do that aren't really captured here. It's not to say that we, we don't, we have, you know, gender is integrated throughout the programming, disability inclusion is integrated throughout. So a lot of things you won't see showing up on this slide, it doesn't mean that CRS isn't taking it into account, but this is just to give you a general idea. So um, I know you guys are all looking at other organizations. It's exciting to hear like Canadian government is up next and kind of what are all the different options you might be thinking about. Um, here are a few things that when I talk to CRS staff, kind of the key things that come out as to why we choose to work for CRS. So the meaningful work, I think, goes without saying, but, you know, it's always gratifying to work on a project, you know, from beginning, project design, get to see it funded and get to actually see it implementing and improving the lives of others. Um, but I think one of the things that keeps CR people at CRS is the team. Uh, we tend to be very passionate about what we do, very kind of um, intrinsically motivated by this kind of work, and um, very supportive to each other. 
we are so highly dedicated that I think it can be like a blessing and a curse. Um, I'm sure you you probably can imagine what I mean, but um, you know, we want our work to be as good as it can be, and we are very conscientious about how we serve others. And at the same time, we you know this can lead us to put in some really long hours um, and and things of that nature. And we do struggle with burnout. And so um, that is a challenge. And CRS has a whole host of things that, um, that we've been doing. This isn't a recent challenge. This is something we know of in the sector. Um, but CRS has some really amazing resources available to, um, to staff. And you know we're all kind of doing our part to to contribute to an agency culture that will um, allow everyone to thrive and, and stay, right? And we do have a lot of people who really stay with CRS for a long time. Um, and, and that's another thing that is really exciting because then you meet so many people that you can learn from and have been through positions that you're now assuming. Um, in terms of learning and professional growth, we have a lot of opportunities for staff. The fellowship program is a really great example of CRS investing in staff doing this full year training and preparing them to move and grow in a variety of roles. But most people don't come to CRS through the fellows program. And, um, and as you move on from the fellows program, you will, you'll want to um, continue learning and growing. And CRS has um, a lot of really amazing opportunities for staff. We do a lot of hands-on um, opportunities like stretch assignments where you can be acting in a role that you are looking to move into. And then we also have a lot of more traditional learning opportunities um, through different courses. CRS also covers, um, will contribute to continued education and certification, you know, if you want to continue your studies, things like that. So there's a, a lot of room to grow. And um, with being such a large organization, there are a lot of opportunities for advancement. Um, and a lot of people will move between different roles in different countries. They may spend some time kind of in a more technical role and then move back towards management role. Um, some people bounce back to their home countries and then go back to the field again. So, um, you know, it's, it's really all about what is best for you um, at the specific time in your life and career journey. I'm gonna touch on some of the benefits that um, you'll receive if you start as a fellow. Uh, so I won't go into that right now, but if there's any questions kind of on benefits in general with CRS, feel free to put them in the chat. And now I'm gonna just take a quick pause to see if anyone wants to come off of mute or ask a question that's sort of related to kind of CRS and who we are before I dive into the fellowship specifically. All right, well, um, I'll keep on going, but I do have my eye on the chat, so feel free to, to jump in and, and stop me anytime. All right, so um, here's a few key things about the fellowship and why people generally choose to pursue the fellowship route. Of course, there are a lot of opportunities available on the CRS career site at any time. So you might be looking at moving directly to a program manager role, um, you know, but here are some reasons why people really um, seek to come through the fellows program. Uh, the first one is the um, learning plan and this time that we offer this 12 month period to really focus on four core areas. And I'll show you those areas in just a second. Um, but this is a time where individuals can really push themselves in areas that they are have less experience and, um, and can really see if there is something there for them that's really, you know, kind of ignites that fire and something that they want to pursue that they may not have thought of. So um, for example, fellows, one of the learning areas is monitoring and evaluation. Another is project design. So maybe these are areas that, you know, if you've done program management, you weren't so specifically focused on those other areas. And this is an opportunity to really um, stretch and grow in a new area. Um, our approach to the fellowship is all hands-on learning. So 
while you're doing project design, for example, you would be participating in a design workshop with partners. You'd be working on the theory of change, a problem analysis, a stakeholder analysis, gender analysis. You'd be really doing all of those things in the context of an actual project that's being designed. And then you would get to move forward with a concept note and then eventually prepare a proposal for a donor, et cetera. So um, all of this, you know, all of the learning is really on actual projects that we, we hope will be implemented. Um, and then similarly, like when you're working on project management, you're working on projects that are already, um, already being implemented. We pair all of our fellows with strong supervisors. Um, this is really important because we want to make sure that you can complete the learning objectives and they are ambitious. So we look carefully at the supervisor that we have for each fellow. A lot of fellows are supervised by former fellows. Um, so that is that makes it easier for them to jump in and they understand what you're trying to achieve during this time. And then of course, probably one of the biggest draws to the fellowship is that strategic advantage when looking at onward roles. So as I mentioned, the fellowship has been around for a long time, has a very strong reputation internally in CRS for developing very strong staff who are very agile and able to quickly learn and adapt to different contexts, who are willing to serve in difficult locations, who are you know, willing to go to different regions and kind of move around as needed. And so when the fellows come onto the job market towards the end of the fellowship, they tend to get pretty quickly snagged up or not snagged up, but you know what I mean, grabbed up, let me put it that way, um, for roles. And, um, and so that's, that is a, an advantage um, as you move forward. Okay, and I'm seeing some great questions coming, great question coming in. Um, does CRS also consider and react swif swiftly with fellows on the ground to crises like the ones in um, Libya and Armenia? Thank you. Those are great questions. The great question. So um, during the fellowship, and I think it's on this next slide. So I'll just advance here. Oh no, sorry. I'll go go forward. I'll come back. So. Um, during the fellowship, we don't place fellows in high security settings. So you're unlikely to be serving in a location that is that is experiencing an early onset emergency. That would not be your main base. Um, however, about half, well, after the first like three, four months of the fellowship, we, we allow fellows to start doing temporary assignments. And temporary assignments are usually four to six weeks. And a lot of fellows go to emergency settings for that assignment. This is up to the fellow. It's not a requirement that you go to an emergency setting, but a lot of fellows are gearing up for that type of role after the fellowship. And so they choose to go to um, one of these, you know, a location in that context for their temporary assignment. So, um, so I hope that answers your question. It's, you know, Yes, if CRS is intervening in those locations, you may get to go there as a temporary assignment, but you would not be based in that location. Um, our play, you know, our principle behind no high security settings. Uh, first of all, CRS is very conservative when it comes to managing staff security in general. And so we usually only have kind of mission critical staff in locations that have high security settings. So we, we don't usually have large teams and especially not large teams with international assignees when it's a high security setting. That's just more risk for staff and, and we, don't, we don't want to have that. So um, we also don't do high security settings for fellows as their base location because we do allow fellows to be accompanied by their spouse or children. Um, so that's that's another reason why we don't do those settings. Um, okay. Okay, just let me go back one second so I don't forget to, to just highlight. These are the core learning areas for the fellowship. So I, I mentioned a couple already, um, the project design, project management, monitoring and evaluation, and then operations. Now, um, we've chosen these four areas because these are the ones that we find are most important for fellows to have a real base training 
before they move on. And that's related to the skills that they use in their onward roles. So um, some fellows will focus on a monitoring and evaluation role going forward. A lot of fellows will do program management. In program management, you have to be able to do meal. You're going to get pulled into project design. And you also have to have a solid understanding of operations so that you know, you know how long is it going to take you to hire a new staff? How long is it going to take you to procure goods for your project? So we're, we're coming at all of these things with the angle of you know, what do you need to know to hit the ground running in your next role? So that's why we focus on these four areas. Um, it is required that fellows work in all of them. We don't allow fellows to say, oh, I just really want to do project management. That, that's not how it, how it works. We really do feel it's important for you to get um, kind of this base training and experience in all of these areas. Um, that being said, you know, if you have a passion for one and you know, like you're really gearing up for a meal role moving forward, then you can do more in the learning section for meal and that will help to better position you for a meal role. You can also do your um, temporary assignment in another country focusing on meal, for example, to get even more experience in that area. So there are some ways in which you can you can tailor the learning plan, but you, you can't um, skip over any of these core areas. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I want to just mention two quick things on placements here. Um, so, oh, okay. I think I just answered this last question too, if they can choose from the, yeah. Okay, good. Um, all right, so on the placements, a lot of times people wonder, well, what will influence my placement and can I sort of um, influence where I am placed? So um, we have, I would say, a few things that we'll look at from the background of the individual that can influence where they may go. And the first thing would be language. So some of the locations where we work require fluency in French or Spanish, Arabic, Portuguese, for example. So if you speak one of those languages, that may influence where we um, ask for you to serve during the fellowship. Um, if you don't speak any of those languages, that's totally fine. You may, you know, you may just go to an English speaking country, you know, something along those lines. So it's not to say that we will definitely use your language capability during the fellowship. We, we may, we may not, but that is something that might influence where you go. The other thing is if you're traveling with dependents, then we would, of course, want to take that into consideration. We might look at which countries are a little bit easier for spouses to work, for example, or which, which countries have a great um, school, for example. And um, the third thing that would influence is where you have worked in the past or where you are from. So we use this opportunity to really um, push fellows to go to a new region and um, or you know to work in a in an area that they haven't been in already. So if you did Peace Corps in a country, you'll definitely not be going back to that country and probably not back to that region. And same if you know you're from a country, we'll be probably asking you to serve in another region. So this is um, this is important to us. It's like kind of to to get a feel for your flexibility. When we make the offers, we'll tell you, like, um, Catherine, we would like you to serve in Madagascar. And, um, and then, you know, you'll have a, you'll get to decide if that will work for you, but we don't change the location based on preferences. So, so here, you know, is, as I said, there's a lot of opportunities with CRS. If you feel really passionate about one specific um, country or region, then I'd really encourage you to look at the openings and apply to something that has a location already stated. I think the fellowship is the only thing you'll find that doesn't have a location stated. So, um, so if you're open to that, then this is the program for you. If you're ready to move around, um, this is it. So, okay. I, I see there's a great question on experience. So I'm going to save that for a few minutes and I'll come back to it. And um, yes, and the language assessment, perfect. So I'll come to that in just a moment as well. So just kind of to kind of wrap up on the fellowship in general, here's a few things that CRS provides for fellows. 
we have a stipend, which is about 34,000 US dollars for the year. And um, this is meant to, you know, just cover your basic needs while you're overseas. So you recognize that it's not the regular salary, but it is what is designed for this year in the learning program. Fellows are hired as regular staff. So all of our benefits and allowances allowances apply to fellows as they do other staff. So that includes, um, you know, medical, health insurance, emergency evacuation, retirement benefits, leave benefits. As you can see here, there's a lot of different kinds of leave. Um, you'll have 20 vacation days, you'll have 12 holidays, you'll have personal leave, sick leave, all of this is paid leave. And then you'll also have allowances and allowances are different by location, but these can be cost of living allowance. Some locations have R&R, &R, um, things like that. So, so there's um, several things that you'll be eligible for as well. And then during the fellowship, CRS covers your housing. Your housing is usually a house or an apartment that's not too far from the CRS office. Um, and of course, we cover your transportation to the fields. Um, we manage your visa process and, and all of that um, for your assignment. Okay, two more things on the fellowship and then I'm gonna pause for some more questions. So here is just, I told you about our core learning areas and how they're designed to prepare you for the onward roles. So this is just kind of a quick list to give you a sense of what are those roles that fellows move into. And um, every year we have fellows who focus on meal roles because meal is happening everywhere. So there's always meal roles available. Um, business development, which is the project design and proposal development um, as well. That's another role that we see you know, around the globe. Um, program quality, which is a little bit of a hodgepodge of, you know, it will have some, some meal in there, some business development, some gender, um, safeguarding, you know, we'll have a lot of things included in program quality. Um, and then there are fellows who will be really passionate about a specific sector and they will move into a program management role that is related to, you know, health or agriculture or something of that nature. And I put some locations here. These are just fellows from the recent classes, but just to give you a sense that fellows do end up serving um, around the world. And this is where, you know, if you're very passionate about a specific region, you can try to gravitate back to that region in your in your first assignment. Not, not to say that you will definitely get there. You may have to be flexible again um, on your first assignment. And maybe it's on your second role after the fellowship that you get back to like that country or region that you're really passionate about. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight about the fellowship here is just that um, we have a lot of former fellows in the organization. Um, and so when you're overseas, you will be most likely have finding some former fellows in your country program. As I mentioned, it could be your supervisor, it could be your country representative, which is country director in CRS lingo. Um, and then we also have a lot of former fellows who are, who are in um, our executive leadership roles as well. Um, so just to say that there's a lot of former fellows in the organization who came and stayed and um, you know, we'll be excited to support you in your journey as well. Um, yeah, safe and dignified programming is, it has a, a couple things built in, but um, safeguarding is one of them. Um, so this is, a lot of it is capacity building with partners, as I mentioned, because we work with our partners directly. So a lot of it is um, par partner capacity building on safeguarding um, to make sure that, you know, the, all of the protection measures are in place for the individuals that we're serving. Yeah. Um, that's a very simplified version of, so I'm just going to leave it there. I hope you don't mind, um, Catherine. We can... Uh, yeah, there, the, so last year there was an APSIA alum that joined us for the call, and she actually moved into a role for safe and dignified programming this year. So, um, so you know, maybe through your alumni network as well, if you really want, if that's, you're very focused on that, we can connect you with her if you would like to learn more. Okay, we've got some awesome, awesome questions, and thank you, Carmen, for adding in the chat. It's really helpful. 
Okay, so let me just pause here for one sec. Um, and there's, I'll answer this last question. So what percentage of non-US citizens are within the fellow cohorts? So it's in the last couple classes, it's been about one third of the class that have been non-US citizens. And those individuals are from, mostly from um, country, countries where CRS has a presence. So um, Nepal, Ethiopia, India, Ghana, Mali, you know, it, it, it really, there's a, a wide range there. All right, anybody want to come off mute here? I know there are some questions on language assessment and, and application and that's the, the next section we're moving into, but made, any other questions on what I've shared so far? Okay. All righty, awesome. Great, okay, so here we have the qualifications and if I remember correctly, there was one um, question, yeah, on the six months of volunteer experience, does remote work count? So thank you for this question. So um, we are pretty firm on the six month experience requirement being an in-country experience. And um, this is really because uh, we are making such an investment in the fellows. We don't want it to be a surprise to a fellow when they arrive and, and realize that this kind of work isn't for them. Like all of a sudden, you know, the internet is really terrible and there's blackouts all the time. And, you know, the capacity of the partners may be not as expected and, you know, work doesn't move as quickly as you thought. So these aren't the kinds of surprises that we want people to face and realize now, like, this isn't the setting for me. Um, so it's important to us that fellows have already done that trial run and have the six months overseas. I know that it's been really challenging lately with the last few years with COVID and a lot of, um, plans people had to work overseas that didn't materialize. So we are um, cognizant of that, but we are still standing firm on the six months. The other requirements that you can see here, graduate degree, obviously all of you are um, gonna meet that requirement. And um, then there was one on the language assessment. So let me say a couple of things about language. We, um, so, English, of course, is required. We do a lot of work with our, um, in English. So um, it's speaking and written English. During the application process, we will look closely at all of your materials you submit. So, um, you know, if we see things that are a little confusing or would need to be edited, that is really gonna bump your application down. So please take the time to demonstrate that you um, can really write convincingly in English. Um, in terms of the second language, we, re we, we require proficiency in any other language in the world. So it may be your native language, in which case the assessment will be very easy for you. Um, so what we do to, for the assessment is, is a 20 minute oral assessment. Um, and we don't, we don't test written knowledge, it is just testing the speaking ability. And um, you essentially will, when we get to that point of the process, you'll tell us which language you would like to be tested in. We've been able to accommodate all languages so far. Um, and so, you know, just, just let us know what is the language you'd like to be tested in. And we'll set that up for you. Um, let me see if there was another on language. Oh yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, someone was curious if they can test in multiple languages. Yeah. Well, so we only require one. So I usually just recommend that you choose one that you are sure you will test at the intermediate level for. Um, so whichever one you're kind of strongest in. Now you see here on the slide that we do have a slight preference for languages where um, that are needed where CRS works. So really, that is. Um, French, Arabic, Portuguese, those are the ones that might give you a little leg up over other candidates if you were to test in those languages, because we would probably utilize that language right away. Um, 
rarely does it come down to looking at two candidates and the deciding factor being what language they tested in. So if you don't speak one of those languages, please don't lose any sleep over it. It's, it's really probably not going to be a critical you know, factor that will weigh on the selection. Um, but sometimes people might say, well, you know, I'm, I'm from Mali and I speak Bambara and French and I'll tell them then test in French because that would be a little bit strategic rather than Bambara, right? So if you have multiple languages, you might consider which one would be um, more, maybe more strategic, but um, yeah, I hope that answers that. I see a couple about the experience um, lived experience. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, as you can see here, if you if you are from um, a, one of the countries, developing country, then, um, then that would count as the experience. Because as I mentioned, what we're really trying to get at is making sure that you're comfortable living in, in, that, in those kinds of contexts. And so clearly you would, um, if you are from a, one of those countries. So you wouldn't have to worry about showing us like six months of work experience there if, if that's where you're from. What counts as a developing country? Yeah, so, you know, I don't have a list that I kind of check off like Costa Rica doesn't count because it's too nice and there's beaches everywhere. Like, you know, so it's, you know, we don't worry about it. Like we're looking for experience outside of your home country. And um, we aren't really considering Europe, right? Because that's, that's, you know, we're, we're looking for something, I'd say like middle, lower income is fine. Um, but, but go ahead, you know, if you have the significant experience outside of your home country, that's fine. Go ahead and apply, please. Um, it doesn't have to be six months consecutive. Thank you for this question. Or in one country, you can definitely have two months in one place and two months in another place and um, all together six months. And that would definitely meet the requirement. Okay, um, more flex. Um, yes, okay, that was the language one. All right, cool. And I see one more kind of general CRS question that let me answer that one before I do the next part, which is on the selection. So um, this is a great question. Is CRS in general an LGBTQ plus friendly working environment? Does it consider non-heterosexual partnerships for spouse support? So um, this is, thank you. I appreciate you bringing this up. So there are a couple areas in which our Catholic background does influence um, what we'll see in terms of staff benefits and things that CRS covers. And there is, and in one way you'll see it in our programming. So let me give you these three examples. So I think they're probably the most, um, probably the ones you would encounter that would be um, most, you know, kind of most common. So um, CRS staff, in terms of who we are as individuals, of course, like, you know, you'll have to talk to everybody and get their own views. But CRS as an organization um, cannot provide benefits to same-sex couples, even if they are legally married in their state and if their marriage is recognized. And this is because same-sex marriages aren't recognized by the Catholic Church. So our um, benefits policy has to follow um, the Catholic Church policy. I'm not sure if we call it a policy, but Catholic Church guidance on this. So um, this is one area that um, you know is a real drawback for individuals um, who in same-sex marriages because they they will not be able to add their spouse to the benefits plan. And this is something that likely you know a, a lot of CRS staff may feel that this is unfair and would love to see that changed. Um, but until the church changes their position on that, CRS won't change our position on that. So this is an important thing to keep in mind, um, you know, as you're thinking about is, is CRS the organization that will be able to support you um, in your, you know, in your career and in your, in your, you know, as your employer. The second thing is that our health insurance plan doesn't cover contraception, and that is also related to um, the Catholic Church um, approach to contraception as well. So those are two things. 
And then when we think about our programming, um, we would you would probably see the see this um, probably the really only way I would say you would you would see kind of the Catholic nature of our work in our programming is that we also don't promote the use of contraceptives in our programming. So, what does this mean? Um, essentially, CRS will provide full and accurate information on all methods of contraception, but we can't promote it by then passing out condoms, for example. So this is something that, you know, we recognize um, has its drawbacks, especially in certain areas of programming, like family planning or HIV AIDS prevention, things like that. So CRS doesn't usually intervene in, in those areas um, that would be of kind of conflict to our our ability to um, you know to to respond um, comprehensively if I can put it that way so for example CRS does do a lot of um, work in HIV and AIDS response but our interventions tend to be in testing and treatment rather than working in prevention and then you know, other organizations would take on the preventative side um, and be able to approach that, you know, in that way, more comprehensive way. So, <clears throat> okay, so I hope that that answers that question um, with those few examples. Oh, okay, and I think that was the last question I'm seeing in the chat. Um, I have one more, a couple more slides, so I'm going to keep advancing, but um, Please, please stop me. Oh, I guess there was one little note here. Candidates of all nationalities can apply. I think um, we already touched upon that by um, going over the international nature of our classes. And um, so you don't need to have US work authorization or you know anything like that. All of our fellows are based outside of the US. So we will get you authorization to work in, in those countries. So on the selection process, there's there's several steps that we go through um, to uh, to select each class. The first things for you all, um, if you choose to apply, is to apply online um, and to prepare your cover letter and your resume. Um, on our website, there in the FAQ session section, you'll see a prompt for our cover letter. We are asking you to respond to a specific question. The question is to tell us how you have promoted or supported greater equity, diversity, or inclusion in the workplace or an academic setting or community setting. So you can choose any example. You can talk about diversity promotion, equity promotion, um, inclusion, you know, whatever you feel compelled to share. Um, it really is important that you respond to that prompt because that's one thing we look at to ensure that the candidate is really applying to this program and it's not just a general application that's being submitted. And um, this is where you know our candidate pool goes from very large to pretty small. So please be sure that to to take the time to do just like a you know just one page just a few paragraphs. You don't have to do anything else in the cover letter. You can just submit a few paragraphs on that. Um, but but that is really important for um, ensuring that your application will advance. We also then have um, we move then to what we. A video interview. Um, it's it's a one way video interview. So essentially, you'll see me or somebody else asking a question, and then you'll have some time to reflect, and then it will start a recording. And this is meant to simulate kind of a regular interview. So it's general interview questions. Um, it can feel a little bit awkward because you're just giving your question to a your answer to a recording, but just know that it's it's just me and sometimes one other colleague on the other end. So you know, just like you can laugh it off, like tell me it's awkward, and then give me your best shot at the answer. Um, and you know, it's we we know that it's not a completely natural feeling um, thing. But it is still very helpful for us to understand more about you, what motivates you, how you manage through difficult situations, how you adapt, you know, things of that nature. 
We are hoping to introduce a phone screen with this year, which would be a short conversation with a recruiter as well. And then the language assessment, which we've spoken about, the 20 minute oral assessment. Um, essentially at each stage of this process, the applicant pool is getting a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. And then the final applicants are invited to do a live virtual interview, which is the interview panel. We also do a group activity. We do a short one-on-one, -on -one, more one-on-one -on -one conversation. We're really trying to get to know you and um, interact with you in a variety of settings through the interview day. We know that not everybody shines in a panel, um, so we, we really try to, to get to know you in different ways, and that's why we have three different activities that we do on the interview day. Um, and then this year's application is closing on November 1st. There is only two um, documents that we ask you to submit for the application. It's just the resume and the cover letter. The, do the application portal does let you attach, like, I don't even know, many, many things you can, but please don't bother. Don't ask for recommendations or attach any of that. We won't look at it at this stage. Essentially, if you, um, after we get through the virtual interview and we would like to make you an offer, that's when we will ask you for your reference information and check that. Um, so yeah, so please don't, um, don't put in any extra effort to share more with us beyond the resume and cover letter at this stage. And then the last thing I'll show you is just kind of, this is a little bit of the timeline. And so um, it is a long process and it starts November when the application closes, we start reviewing and we move individuals through um, first to the video interview and then um, hopefully to a pre-screen call and then to the language assessment. All of that takes a few months. And um, eventually around February is when we usually do the virtual interviews. And then not too long after that, we've paired everybody with a country program and we extend the formal offer. Then over the summer months, we essentially kind of get ready for the experience, which is a medical clearance process. Um, this is only to ensure that you and anyone accompanying you um, will not be unduly at risk, like you can find services that you need in that country. Um, so we do the medical clearance process and then we you know we do visas and things of that nature. And then August 1st or 2nd, you know, whatever is that first Monday in August is, is usually when the fellowship begins. Um, the first month of the fellowship is a virtual training, and so fellows sometimes complete that at home or sometimes they relocate right away and complete that from their country. So we have a little flexibility on when you leave, but definitely by the end of August, you will be in your country and then, um, you know, working, working there for the remainder of the fellowship. And I see some more great questions in the chat. Um, yeah, okay, so for people who don't have six months of experience, um, when do we offer internships? You don't see any posted online. Yeah, so unfortunately, we don't have many internships that we offer. Our internships right now that you'll see online is really only for US-based internships. We don't, um, our team has just shrunk a little bit. And so that's why at this time, we're not um, kind of facilitating overseas internships. So unfortunately, that isn't something that we'd probably be able to do through CRS. Um, but yeah, you know, hopefully you'll be able to find another organization or research opportunity or something that would help you to get that experience. Um, and then, yeah, what are evaluation criteria of candidates? So soft skills and qualifications that we value most. Thank you. This is a beautiful question. So um, once we move into the video interview, like the, the on, online application is kind of verifying like you meet all the regular core criteria. Um, but as soon as we get into the video section, we're really trying to understand more about who you are and your motivation. And we're looking for people who demonstrate that they um, they can adapt in, you know, kind of 
quickly moving and sometimes challenging environments, um, that they're passionate about capacity building because that's a lot of what we do. Um, you know, lots of our programs are focused on capacity building and the way that we work with partners as well. So people who are passionate about empowering others, um, we are also looking at, you know, people who have good kind of discernment, like um, sound judgment, right? Because a lot of what we do is common sense, right? But it can be challenging to, to maneuver in different situations. So we're looking for people who have kind of sound judgment, a great level of resiliency. Obviously, um, when we move into the final interview part, we're trying to simulate an actual work environment and get a sense for how you interact and work with others. You know, how you may draw upon other people's ideas, include others in the conversation, um, and, you know, just kind of be someone that we would, you know, is pleasant person to collaborate with, right? It's not just that you bring great ideas. We all have ideas, but is this somebody that, like, we can see really thriving in our work environment. So those are really more what we're trying to get at in terms of soft skills. Um, yeah, so thank you for this great question too. Like, can we do the fellowship alongside PhD studies? Um, I have, there's a person on my team who just did her PhD while working full time for CRS. So um, I know a lot of CRS staff do do that. I don't know that we've had fellows do it in the past, um, but, you know, yes, like CRS staff can pr pursue advanced degrees while they're working. Um, the fellowship, I'd say, you know, it is in person in the country, right? So you're going to have to be present. So I suppose if you were doing your studies virtually, it'd be possible and assuming like with time zones, you know, you can manage things like that. Um, but I will say that the fellowship is kind of like full in, pretty intense. Um, so, you know, it will be, um, you know, full days. There will be travel within the country where you are. And then there will be this temporary assignments outside of your country. And, um, and those tend to be, you know, pretty action packed in terms of like the amount of things you're trying to do in a small amount of time. So, um, so I'd say, yeah, you know, it's definitely possible, but I would want to be really realistic about like how much time you may have to dedicate to your studies on top of an already very, um, very busy work schedule. Um, and yes, the, the last question I see here, um, do we cover airfare? Yes, I apologize that didn't really touch on that much, but yeah, we do cover your travel to the country, we cover your visas, we cover your housing, all of that. And then if you're traveling with family, we also cover their travel as well. No, okay. no, I also have one that was just shared with me. Um, Carolyn, I know you had your hand up. You're welcome to unmute yourself if you like, or I can read your question. Oh yeah, I can. Thank you so much, Carmen. I really appreciate it. Um, hi, Neta. Thank you. I was just wondering um, about the medical clearance process. Um, for context, I'm an RPCV, so I'm very familiar with uh, medical clearance then making people ineligible um, or sort of rotating them. And so is there anything that would, uh, would our offers then extended in new countries? Like how does that portion sort of work in the, all the things that lead up to that? Yeah, thank you. It's so interesting because I was just talking to another RPCV recently and they were saying how they felt that the Peace Corps process was more about, you know, like a eligibility exclusion factor. And that's that's not at all our approach. So um, we have we have changed locations for fellows. Essentially, we make an offer. Let's say we, we want you to go to Rwanda. Um, then you'll do medical clearance for Rwanda. So if there is, let's say, medications you can't receive there or like specialists that aren't available there, then um, your medical clearance would come back as like pending follow-up. And we would then have to look at what is it that you need? And if we can't arrange for you to get it there, then we'll look at another location for you. So we have we have done that. It's not only for the fellowship. This is actually something for all positions at CRS. 
So even when you move on from the fellowship, you will, let's say you apply to a job in Mali, you'll do medical clearance for Mali. That's all part of our duty of care, but we, we have to ensure that we don't put you at undue risk. So, um, so we've, I've seen other staff get job offers for a location and then not get medical clearance. And again, in that case, CRS works with them to see, okay, what, you know, what else are they going to apply to now? And then where do they go from there? So, um, so yeah, I hope that answers the, your question, Carolyn. Thank you. And we have one last question in the chat before we wrap up. Yeah, so I, I, for, can you withdraw um, an application and resubmit? So I'm, I'll put an email in the chat. It's recruitment support um, at crs.org. I'll put it in here. So I'm not able to really help on the back end of the application system. So I would ask that you email them. And I think what they can do is kind of reset or reopen your application. And then you can change, you know, documents or responses that you may have, you know, if you, whatever you want to change. The other option is to apply with a new email and kind of create a new profile. So if, if that doesn't, recruitment support can't help you, you can always consider a second application. Um, I'm probably not supposed to recommend that, but that might be like, if we're coming down to the wire and you haven't gotten it submitted, you know, try that. Well, we won't quote you on that one, Netta, but we will quote <laughs> you on all of the other fantastic advice that you were able to share with us during the session. Thank you so much. Um, what a tremendous opportunity for graduate students and, and recent graduates to contribute to CRS's work around the world. Thank you to all of our attendees. I put in the chat information on next week's webinar that's focused on Canadian nationals. And we have lots of other content coming this uh, fall. So please, please, please stay in touch with your career office for those opportunities. And as Netta suggested, also be in touch with them to find out who else from your institution has gone on to this tremendous fellowship and can give you even more insider advice. Thanks to all of you. A recording will be available later today on the APSIA YouTube page, and we look forward to seeing you at future APSIA webinars. Thanks so much, everybody.